Uh, I'm in airplane mode, I think. Yeah, airplane mode. I'll just throw that over there so I don't <laughs> I'm tempted to mess with it. Just toss, toss it. Just toss it. Well, Jim, thank you for hopping on an episode of Preaching Lab with us. We're excited to have you with us. Um, I'm also here with my friend, Pastor Christine Hoagland. Hi, Pastor Jim. Yeah. Jim, would you do us a favor just to help uh, us get acquainted with you and our listeners get acquainted with you a little bit? Um, A big, broad question. Who is Pastor Jim Essien? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I started the Paradox Church in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, a little over 12 years ago, uh, I've got um, a wife of 19 years and uh, three girls, 12, 8, and uh, 12, 10, and 8. Uh, and so uh, from Detroit, Michigan, a transplant to Texas, uh, wow. I am not, uh, I've not been converted to the nation of Texas, <laughs> uh, but I do, I do love, I do love uh, uh, my city uh, and, and of course our people. That's awesome. Jim, thanks for hopping on here. What um I think one of the interesting facts about you, correct me if I'm wrong, you were once a like professional baseball player. Is this true? Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, my my kind of quick story, I grew up in a baseball home. My dad played 12 years in the big leagues, managed the Chicago Cubs. He's still in professional baseball, been 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 there for seven decades. So we grew up in a baseball home. Uh, I signed with Michigan State to play football and baseball, uh, so football for Nick Saban. Uh, and uh, this is back in uh, – I'm, I'm old, so this is back in 98, <laughs> 99. Uh, and uh, have been drafted by the Royals as well, Kansas City Royals organization. Uh, and so one of my uh, – you know, kind of quick story, My one of my most frightening moments was walking into Nick Saban's office. Uh, so I was there for the first two weeks of football practice. And uh, I had been drafted, was uh, – unsure of whether I wanted to go play professional or, or stay, you know, go to, go to college sure. and play football and baseball. So I walked into Nick Saban's office uh, when I had uh, decided to sign with the Royals and let him know I was leaving. And, uh, you know, Nick Saban's about five foot four. Uh, I'm six, three. So uh, nothing, nothing about his stature should have been frightening, but it was a scary, scary moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was, he was very gracious of course, to me. And uh, yeah, so I ended up playing eight years in the minor leagues uh, with the Royals organization, Dodgers, Tigers, uh, some independent ball as well. But that was a, that was another life, another life ago, another life ago. Well, Jim, the way that we like to get started on here is we run through what's called the first five. So it's five questions to sort of get the ball rolling in conversation and to sort of give a profile, um, whether as seriously or as funny as possible of what kind of preacher Jim is. So, uh, let's just tee one up here. Do you remember your first time preaching a sermon? And if so, like what happened? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, I, I, I typically think of two sermons as my first, just because the first one uh, happened three or four years before the next one actually happened. Uh, I wasn't wow. a pre, I hadn't really started preaching yet, but the first, first one was, I, I was, I just moved to Fort Worth, was a youth pastor. I was the worst youth pastor in the history of the world. Um, I would like to uh, argue that was me, but you can have whatever you want. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I did everything but pastor youth. I, I, uh, I, I I did everything else. Um, and it was just a, um, it, it, I, I barely remember it. Uh, I kind of remember enjoying it, but I don't, it's, it, it, I don't think of it as the first one. Okay. The first, the first, the one that I think of as the first one is, um, I, I just, I, you know, I was given this, uh, text in the middle of a series on, on, on Ephesians and I was just preaching through, um, uh, Ephesians chapter two. And anyways, what I remember is, uh, one of our pastors came up to me afterwards and, and this was, he, he meant this as a compliment. He said, you are like a masculine Matt Chandler. Um, and so I don't know if that's good for Matt, uh, but, uh, I've told Matt, I've told Matt that story. Uh, but, uh, what's funny about it is that same pastor that told me that is now on staff with us 15 years nice. later. And so, oh, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah. That's so sweet. Let me ask you one more and then Christina, you can run with it for a minute. Um, as a baseball guy, I'm always interested in doing a sports comparison. What, if you're yeah. comparing your like preaching style to the game of either a modern day or a historical like MLB player. What is your preaching yeah. like? 
Yeah, I, I do. I really appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to joke somehow about it'd be like Barry Bonds because somehow I'm doing PEDs while I'm preaching, but I, I couldn't figure <laughs> out how to make the, make that connect. That's the spirit um, of God. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know, man. I, I think you know. I think I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of a brute, uh, you know, preaching like I'm I'm un, untrained, uh, uneducated. Sure. Uh, and if I was to just describe my preaching, it'd just be somehow like I'm just out there just giving it my all. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm some sort of like, you know, Ty Cobb from back in the day, cleats up, uh, right. spiking people, spitting some tobacco juice. I'm in Texas, uh, <laughs> you know, or like a Bryce Harper, just a little bit gritty. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just somebody like Roger Clemens, just throwing, throwing at people's heads. I mean, that, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing up there. Love that. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> how about, you know, just something relatable for the people listening. What's like your most embarrassing or one of your most embarrassing preaching moments that you one can of think your, of? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we all have more than one. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know if this is embarrassing. I was trying to think about the answer to this question when y'all sent it. I, I do the only like memorable, just weird moment like that. You know, I, I, I've misspoken for sure, but not, not nothing that would end up on a YouTube video and, and everyone would be laughing about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I just we were doing three services uh, for a long time, mm. and uh, you know when you when you preach two morning services and then you have to come back and do an evening service, uh, man, that was just a that was just that was, it's just really hard. Super long. Uh, yeah. And uh, I I was burnt out. I was I was it been a long season or something, and I I literally blacked out during a sermon at the five p.m. service. Oh my god! Uh, and you can. And you can, you know, just like for, it was just for a few seconds where I just kind of blacked out. Wow. And, and I was telling the story to my team that, you know, oh, oh. And so I, then I went home and like slept for 48 hours straight. Oh so my, then my goodness. A few days later, I'm, a few days later, I'm telling my team this, we go back and look at, listen to the, uh, to the audio because I remembered this, I blacked out and I like came to, and I just said, Jesus. And you can kind of hear it. <laughs> so, I mean, at least I said Jesus. Right. right? I, I mean, praise too. God. You're right. like, somebody feed me the line. What's the line? What do I say now? Well, the answer awesome. is always Jesus. The answer yeah. is always Jesus. That's so good. Uh, Jim, let me ask, um, if you could, if you could sit down with like three preachers across history. And I'm going to say that Jesus is not an allowed answer on this one. <laughs> We're going to take Jesus out of the rotation here. Who are those guys, men or women that you're like, Hey, I would love to sit down with them and just pick their brain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to try to come up with, you know, some really cool ones that are, you maybe wouldn't expect, but I, I'm just, I mean, Martin, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones was my mm. first kind of mentor, uh, by mentor. I don't mean I ever met him cause he, he, he's been dead for a long time, sure. but, um, he was just the guy I grabbed a hold of when I was, again, an uneducated, uh, no seminary, uh, 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 you know, be church planner preacher, uh, mm -hmm. because he was, he was preaching in post-Christian London. He was preaching in an urban environment, uh, when it wasn't cool to go to church anymore. Uh, it wasn't a thing. Uh, and he was preaching, um, in such a way that thousands came to, came to hear him. Uh, and so I just, I wanted to learn from him. Uh, and then, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, I've got my Spurgeon bobblehead up here. I named my third daughter after Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Her name's Haddon. Oh, uh, cool. Again, he he just he preached to the common man, uh, the common woman, right? Common human. He just he he was he was preaching in a way that people could understand. Uh, but it was the deep, uh, rich truths of God, uh, and uh, planted a lot of churches, and um, you know was able to grow a church preaching preaching the Bible, and it was just beautiful. Uh, and then the, the late, great Tim Keller, uh, mm -hmm. I never got to meet Tim, uh, and, uh, uh, would have loved to have sat down and talked to him about preaching. Yeah, that's awesome. How about for you, Pastor Jim, what are three words that you would use for your own style to describe it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, one of them would just be, um, a, a, a brute. I'm just a brute. I'm just, and by that, I just mean, I'm just. I'm, I'm up there saying stuff and I, uh, I don't think too much about, about it. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah, just a little bit, a little bit gritty, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit gritty, mm -hmm. uh, in, in what I'm in, in what I'm doing. Um, uh, I, what I, I made a, I made a joke at one point I was, I was talking about, uh, you know, that we're all saints, right? There's, you know, saints aren't saints. We're all saints. Uh, you know, there's the, the patron saint of, of plumbers and there's a patron saint of, uh, <laughs> 
you know, and, and I, I call myself the pa- patron saint of jock preachers. Uh, you know, <laughs> Love I'm, it. I'm a, I'm a jock preacher. Uh, I'm a brute. I'm, I'm gritty. Um, uh, that's probably the best way I'd dis- describe it. That's yeah, so good, Jim. It. I what I would uh, love to do because uh, I actually don't know this story. I know bits of it, living near where the paradox was planted and such. Um, the paradox is maybe the most beautiful church in Fort Worth right now. It's maybe the most beautiful church in all of Dallas, Fort Worth. But I would love to know what the story of how you planted the paradox came about because we've we've already heard you were a professional baseball player, you're an athlete, you're an everyday guy, and now, and then all of a sudden you plant a church. So Mm -hmm. I would love to know, how does that story even come about? How does the call to plant a church come about? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, About a year uh, after I was married on Christmas night, uh, uh, God woke me up in my sleep and told me I was going to be a pastor. So depending on how charismatic you are, God woke me up and spoke to me, or I had a urging of the Holy Spirit, or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, depending on how charismatic, uh, God, I, I felt a sense of a call. Um, mm-hmm. and it was, it was, it was profound. Uh, and then, you know, so I just, I played, I played another three years. I, I, I mentioned to my wife, I mentioned it to my mom and didn't really think too much about it. I, we, we grew up in a Christian family, but because my dad was in baseball, we traveled a lot. So we weren't really church folk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never really was a part of a, a, a church until I planted one. Uh, and, uh, or, I mean, I was working as a youth pastor, so I, I guess I was a part of one then, but we, I just didn't understand the church. Um, mm. I didn't really know where they came from. Uh, and uh, when I found out about church planting, I, I was, I was, I, for whatever reason, that was amazing to me. I didn't know you could start your own church. <laughs> Um, I love that. but, yeah. uh, I, I was playing baseball in Atlantic city, um, a, a couple of years after I felt like God had called me to be a pastor and, uh, things weren't well in my career. Things weren't well in my marriage. Mm-hmm. And I remember going across the street. We, we were on this, uh, we, we, we had this rented beach house, uh, and I went across the street to the beach and, and just was praying and reading my Bible and, and really crying out to the Lord. Like what, what, what do I get with being a Christian? Like I, my, my career's not great. My marriage isn't mm-hmm. great. I don't love where my life is. Uh, what do I get? with all this Christian stuff. And, and again, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and he just said, you get me, Wow, uh, you get me. Come on. Uh, and that kind of set me on a trajectory towards, um, the, the calling that God had put in my life, uh, uh, ended up retiring from baseball, uh, a season or two after that, I learned that you could plant your own church. And as soon as I heard about church planting, I just knew that was what God had called me to, uh, a few years before. Uh, and I, 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 I thought I was going to plant back home in Detroit, uh, again, urban post-Christian, uh, my, I have a huge family back home. Uh, but it, it wasn't long before God made it clear that I was supposed to plant in Fort Worth. Mm. Uh, and, and I, I wrestled with that for a little bit. Uh, I'm not from Texas. I don't love country music. I don't have <laughs> cowboy boots. Amen. Um, Amen. My, uh, I'm really funny North of the Mason Dixon line, South of the Mason Dixon line. Yeah. My sarcasm just doesn't quite play. Uh, and, uh, but, but God made it really clear, uh, and, and over a few kind of experiences and, 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 and a few, a few months kind of bound, like my heart was just, uh, soldered to the hearts of the people at Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. Like it was just, wow. uh, it, it, it became a calling deep in my bones. And so, yeah, we started gathering people in our li- living room and, uh, you know, started with eight people in a living room and that grew to eventually 40 and then 60. And then we, we launched Sunday services and, uh, and the whole time, it, it was always very clearly we were called to downtown Fort Worth, mm-hmm. uh, and that's been uh, that was very difficult uh, to find places to meet. And we moved offices about eleven or twelve times, and we, we've we've had Sunday services in about ten or eleven different spaces. Uh, but yeah, it's been a beautiful journey. That is beautiful, Jim. W- and just tell us, like, how's the paradox doing now? What's the paradox up to right now? Yeah, so we, I think you alluded to this, we moved into our own uh, facility uh, back in late March, about five, uh, four or five months now. Yeah. Oh, uh, nice. And uh, yeah, it's been, it, it's been great. I, I, when you look back at the last three years, you know, COVID and, uh, you know, so we, when we look back at our past three years, we had, we had, we had, you know, COVID, uh, we moved not once, not twice, but now three times in the last right. three years. Wow. Uh, and we planted two churches in the last three years. Oh, uh, and so it's been, uh, we went, we did a building campaign during the pandemic. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. Uh, 
Uh, and so just, I mean, God's grace is all over uh, our, you know, our 12 years as a church and, and specifically our last three years. And so, yeah, she's, she's doing great. The church is wonderful. I, I just, um, we are unbelievably blessed by all that the Lord has done. That's awesome. I think that's a beautiful testimony of, of doing something that you think, you know, logistically or on paper wouldn't be feasible. And that's the whole point is that like what you're saying, even with your story of how you became a, a pastor and a church planter, yeah, it's good. like God can do whatever he wants with whatever he wants, COVID, whatever. So that's so awesome that the Lord did that. Praise God. Yeah. yeah. And it is, yeah. y'all, for those of you that are listening and watching, just please just Google the Paradox Church in Fort Worth and just look at all the photos. I occasionally just do it on a Monday morning to remind myself of how beautiful a church can be. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful building. Mm-hmm. Um, so let, let's dig into talking about preaching a little bit, Jim. Um, and we can start broad and sort of narrow it down as we go. What, when, it's it's Monday now, when Jim knows, hey, I'm preaching this weekend, and you're getting ready to sit down and start working on a message, like, what is what is your goal when you're thinking about preaching? What is your, like, do you have a philosophy of preaching? Does that register for you? Yeah, no, a- absolutely. So uh, you're, this is going to probably feel counter to maybe a lot of what uh, you've heard, or that's great, um, or even maybe what you believe about about teaching and preaching. But I actually don't care if anybody remembers the sermon. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I, I don't. I don't preach for it to be memorable. Um, uh, I, I want to fight for clarity. Like I'll, I'll nuance what I'm about to say in, in other in other uh, questions. But my main goal is not that uh, I, I uh, they have a memorable sermon uh, or that they remember anything about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my 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 theology and philosophy around preaching is that in the moment they're uh, they're going to have a meeting with God mm. wow. uh, that in that yeah. moment they have an encounter with God uh, and that that that's the point of, of of the preaching there's teaching and there's books and there's there's discipleship and there's all these other things and, and it's not that preaching isn't any of those things but uh, my main goal for preaching is that they would have a sense of God in his presence that's that's Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, they, they would have a sense of God and his presence in, in the, in the experience, in the moment of preaching. So Martin Lloyd Jones for a long time, wouldn't let his sermon recordings be, be put out, uh, because he, really? he felt like, and he, I mean, he would take the transcripts and most of his books are, are just his sermons, but he felt like something was lost if you didn't actually experience the sermon. Mm. Uh, and I, I think there's some truth to that. Yes. I feel, I feel like the weight lifted off when you say that, mm. like the pressure off of like creating something memorable versus just opening up the gates for the Lord to show up, like to create an environment where people can encounter God. That's really awesome. Yeah. So Jim, would yeah, you I mean, say, I mean, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'll just, I'm mean, going just say like you, you have to kind of maybe play, play out your, your theology and your philosophy around how, how are, how do people change? Mm. And I don't think people change by getting more information. I think they they, they change by experiencing uh, an impactful, transformative moment. Uh, and I think those things come only through an encounter with God. And I think that encounter with God can happen in somebody's quiet time in the morning. It can happen in a moment of repentance and conviction of the Holy Spirit. It can happen in uh, you know all sorts of moments. Um, and I do believe we're formed over time by things. I think that's not unimportant at all, and it's very important. But I just, I think the preaching moment is a supernatural moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jim, the word that kept coming into mind as I listened to you talk about it was, it, it feels like the way you think about preaching is it's very incarnational. Like something is happening in that moment where like God himself is coming into a space, is spirit is touching spirit, and then what may yeah. come from that comes from that. I do think, you said this, Christina, there is something quite freeing about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think often I talk to people who preach and there's this need to like, um, I have to give them three steps to do this thing or it won't, the sermon dies basically. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is the complete opposite. Right. Um, Yeah. So I'm not, I I mean, believe me, when I'm working with young preachers, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure they're, they're applying it. I'm wanting, I'm wanting to make sure that there's uh, that it's that it's practical, especially when it needs to be practical. I mean, there's there's sermons where maybe it doesn't need to be as practical, but there's some that are. Uh, and and so no, I, I think you need to have those kinds of things. I just I want I don't want the whole sermon to serve the practical application. Mm. I want the practical application to serve the moment wow. if that's possible. That's yeah. very good. 
I'd love to hear a little bit, even in the, the conversation around preparation, You, from what you're saying with your story, I'm guessing that you didn't go to seminary. You're saying you don't have a formal education towards you know, church planting and preaching and all that. Is that right? Am I reading that right? Yeah, I have zero schooling whatsoever. Okay, great. Thank, thank awesome. you for reminding me. <laughs> no, <laughs> I resonate. I resonate. This good. Yeah, this is good hospitality for no, our guests. But so I feel going. like that's you know there obviously there's a huge value to education. But I I love to hear like Absolutely. I think the advantage you had coming into this field is that you didn't have to undo maybe some of the academia mm-hmm. that did form structure around how to prepare. Um, but what are sure. the ways that you kind of established that being that you didn't have a launch pad from seminary or mm. other places? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, a couple of answers to that one, um, you know, God, God has gifted some people to do something and and he's not gifted other people to do it. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's a huge part of just gifting in that. Mm. I think sometimes people think, uh, because they have the gift of teaching, that they should be a preacher. And I don't know if that's necessarily mm. true. Um, yep. You know, the, the gift of teaching is a, a, an amazing gift. Um, and, um, but that, that a lot of times that's going to be uh, more of a small group type situation or a, a small classroom type situation or a one-on-one type situation where uh, they are taking, uh, that's another reason why I don't have to uh, worry too much about how much practical application I put into a sermon, because I know I've got a, a church full of, teachers that when they gather in small groups and they are uh, discussing the the text from the sermon and the sermon itself, that there's plenty of teachers gifted in my church that are going to help apply those kinds of things to uh, our members uh, in their lives. And so, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, uh, some people are just gifted in preaching. Uh, so that's one thing I was, gi- I was gifted in preaching. I was good at it uh, from the start. Uh, and obviously, you know, by God's grace, I've gotten better as I've worked hard at it. Um, the, the, the other thing I think is just, we should be learners. Leaders are learners. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and so, uh, for me, I, I wanted to learn about preaching. I read all the books on preaching, uh, preacher and preachers by Martin Lloyd Jones and, um, uh, uh, lectures to my students by Charles Spurgeon and, uh, you know, many, many others, uh, over the years, uh, mm-hmm. on, on preaching, uh, and then listening to preachers. Uh, it's a lot like, um, you know, uh, a, a golfer watching uh, Tiger Woods golf swing or uh, a, a baseball player watching Barry Bonds, uh, you know, uh, hit a baseball. You watch other people do it and you learn by watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, you learn by listening. Uh, and so I, I would uh, I don't listen to anybody's sermons these days. But back back in the day, I listened to a ton of preaching, just mm-hmm. a ton of it. Uh, and, and would just think, why do I like this? Why do I not like this? What, what do I like about this guy? I don't like about this preacher. And, um, and, and just what are, you know, the different strengths and the different ways in which they, they preach. I think you can learn a lot just by, uh, listening to great preachers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Jim, thinking about the way you prep a message, the way you're sort of sitting down to work on one, do you have a, like, do you have a go-to flow that you step into at the beginning of the week that you're like, I know when I'm writing a sermon, this is, this is how I'm trying to format it. This is how I'm trying to build it out. I know I've listened to so many of your messages. You tend towards the like line by line, very exegetical breaking down a text. Is there a format that you're following for that? Or is it just Jim is opening his Bible and going into it on a Monday morning? Well, I mean, you know, a, a year to a year and a half in advance, we're, we're working out that preaching schedule. So, hmm. uh, you know, I've got my preaching schedule all the way through the end of next year. Um, and, you know, in general, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a rule follower at all. So I, I break my own rules all the time, <laughs> but in general, um, you know, I'm trying to go old Testament, new Testament, uh, back and forth. And, and then we do, you know, three or four topical series throughout the year as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, now we did two years through Luke. We did two years through Genesis. Uh, I took a whole year going really slow through the book of Philippians. Um, and, and so it just kind of, you know, uh, plays, uh, plays out, you know, a little bit of a artsy way, a little bit of a creative way, just, um, what, what would be, what would be fun? What would be cool? What, what it, it plays out in a spiritual way? Where, where do I think, what do I think God is doing in our people? What do they need to hear? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so we kind of pick that way, but I'm, I'm generally trying to do a good balance of old Testament books and new Testament books, and then some topical series that, uh, I think our people need to, to hear as well. So then when I, when I, you know, when the week comes, I, I already know the, the text that I'm preaching on, whether that's a topical series or whether we're working our way through a book, 
Uh, I know the, 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 the text of scripture that we're going to work on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grabbing that text uh, and I have my assistant just printed out on a piece of paper uh, so I can, I can jot that, uh, j- jot some initial notes down as I read through it mm-hmm. three or four times uh, and just begin to kind of marinate in the text. Uh, and then it kind of goes from there. Mm. You, I don't want to derail us totally, but Jim, you mentioned something. You're mapped out for a year and a half on your preaching yeah. calendar. Can you talk to the people who might be listening to this who are like, who are the pastors or the preachers who are going, man, I feel like every week is like, I'm barely mm. making it week by week. What is the like, what is the value other than obviously being prepared, but what's the value for having a calendar that's that far built out? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I mean... I, I've always done this, so I guess I thought you—that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's not—it's not easy. I, I would—I mean, I, I kind of used to make the joke, and now uh, is that like they didn't teach me this at the seminary I didn't go to. Um, you know, preaching calendars is a lot of work. We're—we're we're in an urban area. Uh, we're young. Uh, I've got to think through the rhythms of of my city. Uh, I've got to think through my people. Uh, I've got to think through. Um, you know, if I'm going to have, uh, you know, so we're, we're very semester based, uh, with, you know, young, young, uh, young parents with young kids and, uh, just starting to get into school, college kids. Uh, so I want to, I want to typically start a series, uh, you know, in August and in January, uh, unless I'm rolling through like a young, a longer one, like a, a year, a year and a half or two years, but I'm really thinking through those key moments of January and August. Um, mm. those are kind of our semesters. Yep. Uh, then you've got the rhythms of the, of the year. Uh, you've got the summer well, where obviously you're going to be a little bit more, uh, people are going to be more out of town and gone. And sure. uh, that's why I'm going to take some time off. And so you're just thinking through all of those things, holidays and uh, different things like that. And so, I don't know, we just kind of think through that. And I, I've learned over the years now kind of how to do it. And, uh, but yeah, I, I want to know, um, I want to know where we're going and my team needs to know. I mean, we try to, what we try to do is create campaigns around this, the, the sermon series because we do typically longer series than most churches would do, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even when we do a topical series, it's going to be 12 weeks long, probably. Wow. Uh, so we do longer, longer series. And so we just wrap the ministry around that, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, discipleship ministries are going to be connected to the sermon series and the small groups are going to be connected to the preaching and the, the, the songs that we sing on Sundays and the songs that our people write. So we write a lot of our own music. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. All of that's going to kind of flow out of, uh, you know, what, what's, what's happening at the pulpit. Uh, and so a lot of it just centered around the themes and, 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 and the book of the Bible that we're preaching through uh, from the pulpit. Mm. So they just, yeah, they need that time to, to prep and work on that stuff. Yeah. I think just piggybacking off of that, and mm-hmm. we were going to, ask this in regard to preaching too, but I think even in the planning, I'm curious, can you speak to a bit like the balance of planning Mm -hmm. and how the spirit meets you in the planning, but then also like, just how do you leave room for the spirit to, if you needed to pivot, if you feel like, oh man, I really, you know, would you change something? Would you leave it and just trust the spirit's going to be in that? Like, Mm -hmm. how do you kind of approach leaving room for the spirit in regard to that plan to be able to plan that far out? Yeah. Yeah. I do it all the time. Uh, you know, we do it all the time. Uh, we, you know, there's been times where, you know, a, even in the middle of a series, I've just said, you know what, I need to preach on this. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it's happened. Uh, and yeah, all the time. I mean, I, I say I've got, you know, till the end of next year planned out, but for sure it'll change. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, it certainly will change and it does. Um, especially those kind of topical series that we kind of can move around a little bit and, uh, what we think we need now, we might get into next year and be like, actually, this seems more important for us to hit on uh, as a church. And so, uh, typically, those bigger series, the you know, the books of the Bible, those kind of things, they they usually um, you know they usually make it out. And and I think I think that's the idea is like the spirit can move mm-hmm. and you can you can pivot. Uh, which, by the way, since COVID is the worst word ever, so don't ever say pivot. That's a <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. A terrible sorry. word. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, just induces anxiety in everyone. Oh, right, right. Yes, Pivot and precedent, yeah, just out. They're out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but how I've the amount of times that I've seen the spirit use something that was planned a year and a half in advance mm-hmm. and to recognize like, wow, you know, mm-hmm. God, you know, God is orchestrating this. He is He's sovereign over all things. He knew we would preach on this thing. Yes. You know, fourteen months ago. 
uh, and and it was just it was just perfect. And I, I was I'm gonna say this also. There's there's some kind of weird. I don't know if you guys have seen this or if other churches or preachers have seen mm. this. I found there's just a weird symbiotic union uh, between um, what we're preaching on and what the church actually walks through and goes through uh, mm-hmm. as a people. Uh, mm-hmm. So like, I, I kind of make this joke, like I'm afraid to preach through the book of Job because I know that <laughs> it's just going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible. Uh, we preached through the song of Solomon and everybody started having babies and wow. uh, you know, it just, it just seems, it just there. seems, it just seems when, uh, when we preach uh, through a certain theme or topic or, you know, idea um, it, 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 I don't know if it's stirring something up in our people or if the spirit is just kind of doing something there. Uh, yeah. and, and so I just say that to say like, uh, the spirit can sometimes move to where he's saying, I'm doing something. I want you to pivot. But I think a lot of times the spirit just takes the word of God mm-hmm. and draws that stuff out of people. Mm. That's an excellent answer. I feel like what I hear you saying is the value of like preparing, trusting that the Spirit's in the preparation. He can plan for things that we would never even yeah. guess for. And also like leaving margin for if you need to, that yeah. you're also not throwing your teams under the bus. Like there's movement in your year from what you're saying where like you could pivot and also you're honoring your team's time because it's like there is a plan in place and also. I, I think that's great. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Jim, I... You've described your preaching style, and I've I've heard it. So it is very like straightforward. I, I feel like you have this value of like being connecting with the every man or the every woman. You you want to be who you are off a platform, same person you are on a platform. Was that always natural for you, or was that something that like over time you found yourself being like, oh, this is just who I've I've figured out how to be Jim in both places? Because um, I can think of myself, and I think of other preachers who are trying to figure out how to step into it is there's often this tendency for people to, they even verbally, they talk one way off a platform and then they get on a platform and they all of a sudden, it's like they've put on a different voice, but, which I think is right. a sign that they're just sure. not quite sure who they are. Has, sure. Was that natural for you? And if it, if it was or if it wasn't, I would also love to know, Jim, what would your advice be to the young preacher who's trying to find out what their voice yeah. is? Yeah. No, that, all, all of that is really good. I mean, you know, we, uh, Martin Lloyd Jones said that preaching is, is logic coming through someone who is on fire. Mm. Uh, and so there's a sense in which, which it's coming through someone, like there's a personality, there's a personality in the biblical writers, you know, uh, God is, God is, you know, the spirit is the, uh, the, the primary author, but he is writing through human authors mm-hmm. and human personalities. Uh, and so, yeah, you want to, you want to find your own voice that only uh, in the end, that only happens through reps. Uh, you can do some things that hinder that. You can only listen to one kind of preacher instead of multiple preachers to no, learn from. Mm-hmm. Uh, you end up being a parrot of the one that you listen to mm-hmm. instead of just being you. Uh, and uh, and and it's just yeah, it's it's reps, reps, reps. And it's just being you. I think it's being comfortable with who you are. Uh, if you struggle with the fear of man, um, to a certain degree, I would say you're probably just not ready to be in ministry, uh, and you're probably not ready to preach mm. uh, because. Ooh. That it's just an incredibly, incredibly difficult to serve people when you're afraid of them. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and so I would just say like, you know, not many of us should be teachers, <laughs> James right. says, right? So, uh, and so just being in a, a place of like, you're comfortable in your own skin. Uh, you don't have this kind of uh, disproportionate fear of man. Like, you know, we all have it to some degree, but if that's a thing for you, that, that probably has to be worked out before you stand on a stage and start and start preaching and teaching. Um, but then I would also say, so I just want to, want to counter all of that by saying, um, there is a, uh, you uh, you know, depending on, on, on your listeners, some of them are not going to like this. There's a performance to this though. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and so the way that I've described it for some of the guys that I've, you know, raised up over the years, um, if, if, if you're a five out of 10 in terms of energy and passion and, 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 and extroversion, fine. Be, be your five out of 10. Like you don't want to be somebody you're not, but I need you to be a six out of 10 when you're on stage. Mm. So I just need you to ramp it up just one notch, one notch. when you get on stage so mm-hmm. because it actually doesn't come through as you think it does. Uh, you There's something about the stage itself uh, that um, 
It just it 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 your five out of ten actually is a three out of ten on stage. Mm. It just well feels said, slower right? mm-hmm. and duller and more boring. Uh, mm. And then you actually are. You really aren't that boring, but on stage you are. And so I just need you uh, to to just ramp it up just a hair. Uh, and and so I, I I'm not afraid as you know as uh, biblical and and theological as I think I am. I, I I don't I don't think it makes any sense to not think through some of the just pragmatic practical aspects of of that. And so even if you read like Spurgeon lectures to my students, he's talking about. He's got chapters in that book about your posture and 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 your voice and uh, how you even speak and 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 all of that. I, I just think those things are important when we're talking about uh, preaching as well. And so, uh, don't be afraid as you find your voice uh, to be uh, to stretch to stretch in, in areas in which um, you know if, if you're you know my voice is not I'm not great at telling stories I'm not great at those things. But I need to grow in them. It'd be silly for me not to grow in that. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I might not be great at being funny, but I, I need to grow a little bit at being funny. And uh, <laughs> so stretch yourself, even as you are trying to find yourself. If that makes sense. Yeah, I want to follow up on something before before we go to our next little space here. But one of the things you kept talking about is is like, man, you just you need to get reps. You've got to like you've got to have a space yeah. where you can actually like do the thing. Um, what's some advice you would give to someone who's going, okay, I want reps. How do I get reps? How do I like, how do I have those conversations? How do I figure that out? What advice would you give to them? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, teach in the kids ministry, uh, mm. you know, uh, tell the youth guy and the college guy and the campus pastor guy and the, uh, by, camp, I, by you know, campus student ministry type type people, just tell everyone that you're ready, that you're there, that you're mm. available. Um, and, uh, you know, lead it, lead a small group. Uh, because obviously you're not going to preach at the small group, but your two minute exhortation or explanation, Mm -hmm. uh, either will land or it won't. Mm. And you'll learn from it. Uh, it'll either connect or it won't. And you'll Mm. learn from it. Uh, it'll either resonate with, with the seven people in your living room or it won't. And you'll learn from that. Uh, Mm. you know, I, in some ways I was, um, uh, well, well, in some ways I was, uh, it was to my detriment that I, I mainly just. My, you asked me what my first sermon was. Uh, my fifth sermon was my church that I started. So I wow. preached four times before we, we planted the Paradox Church. Uh, and so I didn't get a lot of that. But what I did get was uh, reps in my living room, you know. And, and again, it's not preparing a sermon, but I'm, if I'm preparing a lesson, I'm going to teach through it. Uh, and, and I'm getting those two-minute-at-a-time exhortations or explanations. Uh, again, those are either good or they're not, and I can learn from that. And so I just think teach and preach wherever you can as often as you can. Um, but, uh, I mean, writing and mm. all the, right. any sort of, any sort of teaching or communication, do it with blog posts or Facebook posts, put together a little paragraph. You have a thought that comes to mind. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, even when I wasn't even like obeying Jesus and was doing all sorts of terrible things, uh, I was always drawn to the Bible and when I would read the Bible, I would do ser- I would do sermons, like I would write down like sermon outlines, then I would go to the ballpark, then I would go out at night and go to the bar and go to the club. Uh, wow. and, and I did that for years until I, you know, the Lord kind of called me back to himself. And so mm. I'm just, just saying that to say, like, when you, if you're a preacher, you preach, if you're a teacher, you teach, if you, mm. if, if you, when you, you know, write down sermon outlines, mm. uh, and, and work those out in different spaces and just learn. Learn to see what connects with people and what doesn't. So good. Yeah, that's excellent. I really love that. Um, we're going to move into just talking about, you know, you're just sharing more kind of the authority that you speak from from the stage, how you can hone your craft mm-hmm. in that sense. But also when we think about the authority that we carry into preaching spaces, we know that it needs to overflow from our own life mm-hmm. to be able to carry authority. And so what are some ways that you have maybe protected or maybe rhythms you have um, in your life or just things that you've done to kind of protect that, your personal life, your heart before Jesus, your mm. integrity, all those things. How do you um, just, yeah, how do you do that in your life? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. It, they kind of work for me um, together, if that makes sense. So the, the fact that I have to preach uh, is sobering enough mm. that, um, I'm concerned about my own integrity and own character mm-hmm. and heart. And then 
the, the, the stuff that I'm doing for that then protects the preaching if that, if that kind of makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. what is, what does Paul say? I mean, I, I want to, I want to beat my body into submission, mm. uh, so that, uh, I don't, I don't disqualify myself after preaching, mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So he's saying, I, I, I need to have the kind of self-control conviction, integrity, um, uh, healthy habits, uh, off, you know, out of the pulpit so that I don't disqualify what I just said in the pulpit. Right. Uh, and you know, what did, what is, you know, Jesus say about the Pharisees, they preach, but do not practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and really like you can find a, a, um, a definition of discipleship in, in Paul's letter to Timothy when he, he says, he says, uh, uh, he, he says, um, he says to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Mm. Yes, so watch wow. your doctrine closely, like know the teaching, mm-hmm. know what you believe, know what's right, know what you're going to preach, but also watch your life closely, mm. uh, live that out. And that's what discipleship is. It's, it's, um, it's, it's preaching and practicing. It's mm. uh, doctrine and life. It's yes. what you say in the pulpit and then what you do outside the pulpit. And so uh, I think they kind of work hand, hand in hand. And so I, I know um, that I'm going to go preach on a Sunday morning and I know that I can't stand up there with any sort of integrity um, you know, if, if my life isn't matching up with that. And of course, when my life doesn't match up with that, then there's, there's gotta be repentance and, and humility and, and all of that. And there's mm-hmm. been plenty of times where, uh, I've got to, I've got to, you know, confess before the Lord and before friends and, and my wife, man, I just, I, I feel it's hard for me to think about going and preaching right now. I just feel, um, uh, guilty and I feel, you know, unworthy and, and all of that. And that, mm-hmm. that's when the grace of God meets you. And I'll tell you, those are some of the most powerful sermons yeah. uh, wow. are when the grace of God uh, has met me. And then I can then uh, hopefully translate that in the sermon to, to my people. Um, but, but to give you some more practical, just a practical answer, um, it, being an emotionally healthy leader, I actually have a, um, a PDF that I created uh, for our people around that, just uh, creating um, healthy rhythms, I think it's called. Mm. Uh, and, and just what does it look like spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, financially Mm -hmm. to create healthy rhythms, uh, in your life, uh, to, to try to, um, protect yourself from some of that. And here's what I've actually learned on that. Once you get that in place, that itself can be a crutch that you lean on and you forget the spirit. Mm. So I just want to, I've just worn like, here, here's my here's my warning because I I'm, my guess is that the majority of people are listening are even a little bit younger than me. Mm. Uh, so our generation and younger, right? This kind of generation of ministers right now, we are so like we're all John Mark Homer, you know, uh, uh, practicing the way and and uh, you know uh, elimination of hurry, ruthless elimination of hurry, and, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 all of that, and healthy rhythms and Sabbaths and all of that are huge. Mm-hmm. They're huge. They're so important. What a great what a great practice. Uh, for us to to learn in, in this generation, but here's the thing: uh, the spiritual fruit in Galatians five uh, of self control, for example, mm. uh, gentleness, patience, right? That fruit of the spirit is just that; it's a fruit of the spirit. Mm-hmm. It's the spirit that's going to produce that in you. Yes. And so, if we are leaning too much on our rhythms and not mm. as um, and not on the spirit, then I think we're going to end up finding ourselves a slave to the rhythms uh, uh, and and not a slave to the spirit uh, or maybe more theologically, not a son to the father mm. uh, or a, a daughter to the father uh, mm. because of the spirit. And so I just, I've just seen that, like we've, we've had church planners, you know, people that want to come plant a church or, um, and they already have their Sabbath. Uh, I'm sorry. They're, um, they're sabbatical planned. <laughs> like you, you know, you have to go off break before you go on break. You know, you can't, mm. you can't have your sabbatical plan before you've started the, the actual church. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. And I, I, I really do. I, re- I really appreciate the idea of healthy rhythms. I'm all up in it. I've been teaching them for years. Uh, but I've just found even myself, I, I found that I can be a slave to the rhythms and completely forget the work of the spirit uh, that's necessary in my life. Yeah. Uh, and I just think that's, that's hugely important. So man, just, uh, have the rhythms, just have those rhythms serve exactly. your actual encounter with the living God. Right. I love that. Like having those things serve to make space for. And I hear a lot of balance in what you're saying. Like just mm. 
again, you're, I feel like you're disarming a lot of the things that we've kind of historically yeah. heard as the greatest parts of preaching or maybe held too high sometimes, which is that also you are a human, you mm. know, and, and so you have to practice, we all have to practice just the things in scripture that God calls us to period. Mm. And so I love that you're just bringing a balance to like, my life is my life before the Lord. It That doesn't mean that I have to have some super gifting of yeah all these extra layers of integrity or whatever before preaching. Like yeah, I'm sure. coming as I am, just like I would using any other gift. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Jim, I, I'd love for you to speak to, for a second, because uh, you're a church planter. That's who you are. I hear that. Like, that's your story. That's who. That's what comes out of you. Church planters are often so entrepreneurial, so like forward thinking that I, I, I recognize in them that they're often going like, I don't know if I have time to watch my life as, you know, as Paul writes to Timothy. I don't, I don't have time. I have time to plan a great church. I have time to uh, prep a great sermon. Um, what's maybe like a word of encouragement you would give to the person who's planting or, or in the early stages even of planting a church or a congregation that's going, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to implement this like watching my life, but I feel so swamped by what ministry is or even what preaching is. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I just, um, there's this uh, John Piper tweet uh, or X, what is it called now? X, Whatever you know, it is. I don't even know what it's no called anymore. anymore. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, uh, that's out there that basically says what, what social media or what Twitter will be used for on the day of judgment, uh, is just evidence that we had plenty of time. Um, and I, I listen, I'm, I think we have incredible amount of time, uh, in the day. Uh, and I think that we, um, we waste a lot of it by either, uh, not doing the things that are real ministry and mm. really move the ball down the field, uh, or just are they're, they're the typical time wasters, social media, t- Netflix, uh, and, uh, and, and things like that, uh, you know, unnecessary meetings and, you know, you know, just uh, learn how to work. Uh, mm. it's just learn, learn how to work, learn how to do what's most important next, learn mm. the priorities, learn, learn the, the right kind of ministry and, and all of that. So that's just general. Um, I've not, I've not found, um, uh, uh, again, in um, in most of my experiences with with church planters, that they're working too hard. Mm. Um, I've found that they're just not working on the right things uh, mm. enough. Mm. Uh, you know, this is a wow, preaching yeah. podcast. Uh, yeah. Here, here's the thing: when you're a church planter, you can't spend 15 hours in prep for your mm. sermon on Sunday. Uh, you can't do that because you have too many other things to do. And until you're a bigger church with more staff, uh, you're just not going to be able to do that. Uh, you're going to have to learn how to prepare a sermon in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, um, and so just, you know, figure that out and know that your sermons aren't going to be the the greatest thing ever yet. And that's okay. Um, Because, you know, you have some other things that you're doing as you're, as you're trying to build a new organization, a new church. Um, And then the other thing I would just say is it's okay. It's okay to go to bed tired. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's okay to get to the end of the week Mm -hmm. and and to get to your Sabbath because you should take a Sabbath uh, exhausted. Uh, that's why we have the night and that's why we have uh, the Sabbath and that's why we get a day off and that's why we get uh, a week off, you know, take your PTOs. Um, but it's okay to go to bed tired. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I think that we have this kind of sense now uh, in this world of self-care and uh, all the many other selves that we, that we're practicing uh, to um, think that it's, we're doing something wrong if we're a little bit tired or if we're a little bit discouraged or if we're a little bit sad or if we're a little bit, it's okay. That's just life. Um, and you should spend yourselves, you know, Paul says to the Corinthians in seven Corinthians 12, I would gladly spend and be spent for your soul. Mm. Uh, he talks about this litany of sufferings he's faced. And at the end right, of it, he says right. on top of that, there's the anxiety that I have for all the churches. Mm. So I, th- this wow, idea yeah. that we wouldn't spend ourselves and be exhausted is that that seems silly to me. Um, and so, yeah, I just think if you uh, if you're going to disciple your people, uh, if you're going to evangelize your neighbor, if you're going to be a good dad or mom to your kids, if you're going to be a good spouse, uh, if you're going to um, prepare a teaching or a sermon, uh, if you're going to lead your staff or your volunteers well, uh, and uh, and if you're going to take care of your your body um, and your mind and, uh, you know, some of those things that you need to do, and then you have time for Netflix, then you do Netflix. Uh, but, Mm -hmm. but if you don't, then just Netflix maybe should be the thing that goes first. 
Uh, and, and it's okay if you go to bed tired. <laughs> Jim, you're being That's a good, good pastor right now. Yeah. <laughs> you're just being a pastor. I can see it. What, uh, let's spend the last couple of minutes here. I want to talk about creativity with you a little bit. Um, I sent this over in my notes to you. I think one of the things I've always uh, wrestled with when I think about line by line preaching the um, is that what what can what can often get tossed aside or at least seemingly is some level of creativity to bring like the text to life. Do you feel like that's is that a fair thought about line by line preaching or is that like a man you're just missing what's really going on here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think my best answer to that question is, um, if, if you're good, you'll be good. And if you're not good, you won't be good. Like if, if, um, you know, so there's people that do topical series that aren't very creative. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, they're, they're running through just a, a rebrand of the same three points on relationships or the same three points on money that, uh, they did before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, no, I, I, I just think, yes, you've got the expositional exegetical preachers that, uh, are boring and they're not creative and basically they're a running commentary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and they just yeah. explain this verse and then they explain this verse and they, mm-hmm. that's just not good preaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've got topical preachers, you know, Spurgeon was a topical preacher, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and they can be creative and good and, and, and rich and fresh and, impactful in what they're teaching and preaching, or they can just be boring. Mm. Uh, there's plenty of boring topical sermons and topical series out there as well. Yeah. So I'll just say, if you're good, you're good. Uh, and I would also say like, there is an art to preaching. And I think that's the, the, the thing that uh, you don't probably learn in seminary. Yeah. Uh, there's just an art to preaching and, and you can't really know how you're going to teach a text. Uh, you can't use a formula to teach it. I, I don't think you can. Because each text just is different. Um, each genre of the book of the Bible is different. Uh, and what it's doing to you and how it jumps out at you and all of that, there's an art to the sermon. Uh, and if, if, if you neglect the art of the sermon, it's just not going to be very good. Uh, and those that are good, there's an art to it. Uh, and they're weaving together a thread, a theme. They're, they're asking a question early on and, and creating some tension and it doesn't really get answered until the end. Uh, they, they do a callback, you know, at the end, uh, you know, so this past Sunday uh, started with an illustration from Hosea, uh, we're teaching in Revelation, but it was started through an illustration mm-hmm. in Hosea and the conclusion came back to Hosea and the end of Hosea, what, mm. what, what happened next in the story. Um, and so there's, you know, there's ways of crafting the sermon that, mm-hmm. uh, creates that kind of interest and tension and, and the pace, there really needs to be a pace to preaching. Uh, a lot of our sermons, they're, they're, they're just, you know, they just go like this, you know, just straight ahead. And there's no sense of like speed or pace or, or rhythm to them. So that's all right. art, uh, and, and creativity and word smithing and, mm-hmm. and all of that, you know, cool stories or funny stories mm. are one thing. Uh, I think, I think richer, richer preaching, um, you know, more depth is really thinking through, um, uh, that the other kind of that, that art stuff, mm. uh, the pacing and, and the man, how does this, how might this metaphor work and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a depth to preaching that the expositional preacher and the topical preacher could both find. Mm, that's mm-hmm. good. That is good. Yeah, we we came from a church before here that was um, also exegetical line by line, and I think what I've found like, do you think that with it, it, it acts more as a guide? Like what you're saying, even your reference to you're going to Hosea, then to Revelation, back to Hosea. Can you speak to like if somebody is going to preach line by line? What's the freedom to find? Like how how much do you have to be guided solely by here's the six verses I have? Hmm. Like, do you feel do you feel the freedom to be like, I read it all at the beginning, I read the six verses. Now I'm gonna go wherever I think I need to go, or do you feel like every single word is important? Like, how do you kind of approach that? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a, this is a great question. Uh so the running commentary uh exegetical preacher is boring. Um because they're, unless they're really, 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 really good at it. Okay. So I will say there are some that do that, but they're just excellent at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, that that's, so that's kind of the, um, the, the, the guys that kind of lean towards the preachers that kind of lean towards, uh, 
uh, expositional or exegetical, they think that's what you have to do. You have to teach every word, every line. Mm -hmm. And that's not exactly what expositional preaching is. It's not Mm -hmm. what gospel centered preaching is. I want to take the main idea of the text, right? So Revelation 17 yesterday, uh, the main idea of the text is that, uh, you know, who who is Babylon? Uh, Why is she called a prostitute in Revelation 17? And, and she's, she's going down. She's, she's going to be destroyed. So I, I, it's revelation 17. There's no way I could teach every word and every line of that. <laughs> right. uh, that's, it's crazy. That'd be crazy difficult and it wouldn't serve anyone. Mm. But if I can pull out the big idea there uh, and use, use the, the, the verses around it to help support that. Uh, if I need to go somewhere else in the Bible or I'll, I'll sometimes I'll do what I call just uh, an excursus. Uh, I might, I, I might, you know, take five minutes and go on a rant uh, over here on on some doctrine, maybe, or on some practice, mm. because mm. I, that's where my heart or my mind went when I was reading through the text. Mm. So, yeah, I, I I have a lot of freedom to do that, but it's all meant to serve the main idea. So, what is the main idea? And and so, I think the difference between the two, if I would say the best definition of the difference between a topical sermon and a uh, expositional sermon is the main idea of the expositional sermon comes from the text you're expositing. Mm, mm-hmm. The main idea of the topical sermon comes from your, you know, whiteboarding creativity that you did. I'm not saying right. that's bad. I do that too. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're, you're, I'm saying, you know, six months from now, I'm going to preach on money next summer because I've never actually done a topical series on money. Uh, and I want to teach on consumerism. I've already decided my main idea is consumerism. Sure. So now I've got to think about what is the best text that I can teach from, or maybe even a few texts that I want to teach through. Mm-hmm. But I've already decided what that is. Whereas if I'm teaching through Revelation as a book, when I get to Revelation 17, the main idea has to come out of Revelation 17. Yeah, that's so good. And I loved what you even said earlier about you know your congregation, you know the type of people that and the caliber of people you have that are able to, if you don't say every word, you're also giving them now something to do on their own. When they go home, they can go and be like, oh, he didn't talk about this verse that much. I'm just going to study that on my own. And and you give people it back into their hands, which I, I really like that. That's good. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but I've been a Christian for, you know, I don't know. I've been really, really, really following Jesus for over 20 years. Um, and I've read my Bible a lot and I've taught a lot of it. Uh, I can still go back to the same books of the Bible that I've taught through yeah. And see new things 100%. and have it yep. hit me in different ways. So the, you know, my dad always said, and he stole this from somebody, but he, he always said to me, he said that the, the Bible is so shallow that no baby Christian can drown, but it's so deep that no theologian can touch bottom. Mm. Uh, that, and yeah. so to think that we're going to exhaust the text in one sermon, uh, just seems, um, it seems unnecessary and also seems, uh, kind of ridiculous. Well said. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much for joining on th- joining us on this episode today. You're like, you, I've realized as, I, as we've been talking, I've had moments where I'm sort of just zoning out and listening to you, which I don't normally do <laughs> when we do these, but I'm like locked in on what you're saying. So I can imagine what a gift you are to the people who call the paradox home. Um, what I like to do on this is at the end is give you as our guest an opportunity to give a word of encouragement or just a pastoral word. We have people who listen to this who preach who they're right now, as we're talking, they're working on their sermon for next Sunday. As they listen to this, they're going to be in the same spot. Do you have a word of encouragement, a pastoral word? It can be prophetic. It can cut to the throat, whatever you need to do, but <laughs> um, that you would love to share with those who are getting ready to preach. Man, the the, the word of God does not return void. Mm. I mean, the, the promise is that if we preach the word in season or out, season, out of season, uh, that it will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. Mm. Um, and I, I just, I, so that, let me say it this way or a couple of ways. Um, preach God's word passionately and faithfully. Mm. Uh, it will accomplish what you, what, what, what God's going to do in your people. It's going mm-hmm. to accomplish it. That's the promise. You cling to that. Mm-hmm. That, that takes all the pressure off, takes all the pressure off. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is, uh, you know, Ray Ortland, I heard him say this at one point and I've just, for whatever reason, it's stuck with me. He just said, I, I get to serve my people by mm-hmm. preaching. 
And there's just something about that that I, I think of almost every Sunday before I walk on stage is I get to serve my people. Mm. Uh, and that that's what I mean by if you have a fear of man, you shouldn't preach. Um, if, if I go in with the posture of I get to serve people, it's going to be way better than if I go in with a, man, I hope this sermon's going to be great. Mm-hmm. Uh, because one of those is yeah. for me and one of those is for them. Uh, and, uh, either, either I'm preaching for them to serve and love them and shepherd them and teach them and disciple them, uh, or I'm preaching for me, uh, and one honors God and one doesn't, wow. one is a sin and one is, one is actual ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the third thing I would just say is ask God to help you to preach through tears. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that regardless of your personality, and I don't mean you actually have to preach through tears though, praise God, if he gives you that, um, but you, there's a different preaching can be good. It can be great or it can be impactful. And I think two things make it impactful. One is just the spirit of God and his sovereign will deciding to take a sermon and just, you know, stamp it to people's hearts. And I think the other thing is, um, it's come, it's logic coming through somebody on fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when, when there, when the, when, when Jesus has done something in your heart and that's, that's expressed or seen in some sort of way by your people, uh, it has an impact. Mm. So good. Je- yeah. You gave us three, you gave him three things, which is more than anyone has given him so far, which is great. <laughs> uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this has been an episode of Preaching Up. Christina, you jo- thank you for joining us yes. as well. Pastor Christina, Thanks, all Pastor the guests Jim. today. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time.